As mysterious as it might be for tiny particles in an atom to act this way, the evidence quickly mounted showing that Bohr was right. In more and more experiments, electrons followed a different set of rules than planets or ping pong balls. Bohr's discovery was a game changer. And with this new picture of the atom, Bohr and his colleagues found themselves on a collision course with the accepted laws of physics. The quantum leap was just the beginning. Soon Bohr's radical views would bring him head to head with one of the greatest physicists in history. Albert Einstein was not afraid of new ideas. But during the 1920s, the world of quantum mechanics began to veer in a direction Einstein did not want to go. A direction that sharply diverged from the absolute definitive predictions that were the hallmark of classical physics. If you asked Einstein or other physicists at the time what it was that dif distinguished physics from all kind of flaky speculation, they would have said it's that we can predict things with certainty. And quantum mechanics seemed to pull the rug out from under that. One test in particular, which would come to be known as the double slit experiment, exposed quantum mysteries like no other. If you're looking for a description of reality based on certainty, your expectations would be shattered. We can get a pretty good feel for the double slit experiment and how dramatically it alters our picture of reality by carrying out a similar experiment, not on the scale of tiny particles, but on the scale of more ordinary objects, like those you find here in a bowling alley. But first, I need to make a couple of adjustments to the lane. You'd expect that if I roll a few of these balls down the lane, they'll either be stopped by the barrier or pass through one or the other slit and hit the screen at the back. And in fact, that's just what happens. Those balls that make it through always hit the screen directly behind either the left slit or the right slit. The double slit experiment was much like this, except instead of bowling balls, you use electrons, which are billions of times smaller. You can picture them like this. Let's see what happens if I throw a bunch of these balls. When electrons are hurled at the two slits, something very different happens on the other side. Instead of hitting just two areas, the electrons land all over the detector screen, creating a pattern of stripes, including some right between the two slits, the very place you'd think would be blocked. So what's going on? Well, to physicists, even in the 1920s, this pattern could mean only one thing. Waves. Waves do all kinds of interesting things, things that bowling balls would never do. They can split. They can combine. If I sent a wave of water through the double slits, it would split in two, and then the two sets of waves would intersect. Their peaks and valleys would combine, getting bigger in some places, smaller in others, and sometimes they cancel each other out. With the height of the water corresponding to brightness on the screen, the peaks and valleys would create a series of stripes in what's known as an interference pattern. So how could electrons, which are particles, form that pattern? How could a single electron end up in places a wave would go? Particles are particles, waves are waves. How can a particle be a wave? Unless you give up the idea that it's a particle and think, aha, this thing that I thought was a particle was actually a wave. A wave in an ocean? That's not a particle. The ocean is made out of particles, but the waves in the ocean are not particles. 
And rocks are not waves. Rocks are rocks. So a rock is an example of a particle. An ocean wave is an example of an ocean wave. And now somebody's telling you a rock is like an ocean wave. What? Back in the 1920s, when a version of this experiment was first done, scientists struggled to understand this wavy behavior. Some wondered if a single electron, while in motion, might spread out into a wave. And the physicist Erwin Schrodinger came up with an equation that seemed to describe it. Schrodinger thought that this wave was a description of an extended electron, that somehow an electron got smeared out, and uh, it was no longer a point, but was like a mush. There was a lot of argument about exactly what this represented. Finally, a physicist named Max Born came up with a new and revolutionary idea for what the wave equation described. Born said the wave is not a smeared out electron or anything else previously encountered in science. Instead, he declared it's something that's really peculiar, a probability wave. That is, Born argued that the size of the wave at any location predicts the likelihood of the electron being found there. Where the wave is big, that's not where most of the electron is. That's where the electron is most likely to be. And that's just very strange, right? So the electron on its own seems to be a jumble of possibilities. You're not allowed to ask, where is the electron right now? You are allowed to ask, if I look for the electron in this little particular part of space, what is the likelihood I will find it there? I, I mean, that bugs anyone, <laughs> anytime. As weird as it sounds, this new way of describing how particles like electrons move is actually right. When I throw a single electron, I can never predict where it will land. But if I use Schrodinger's equation to find the electron's probability wave, I can predict with great certainty that if I throw enough electrons, then say 33.1% would end up here, 7.9% would end up there, and so on. These kinds of predictions have been confirmed again and again by experiments. And so the equations of quantum mechanics turn out to be amazingly accurate and precise, so long as you can accept that it's all about probability.